Blog Talk Radio. Good evening. Welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour, or 45 minutes, rather. And I'm the regular host of a program called Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com that is heard Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time. Tonight, we're going to continue with Part 8 of our series of programs dealing with dispensational futurism, what I call the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. We began by reading the Jesuit oath. We continued thereafter with a a lengthy analysis of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. And now we're reading from a little book called The Origin of Dispensational Futurism and its Entry into Protestant Christianity. And I'm sure if the listeners are careful and examine this information and read for themselves, they will discover what I have discovered, that that which I have been taught for 50 years of my life, dispensational futurism, is a Jesuit lie, and it's the very heart of the Jesuit-led New World Order. If Protestantism today will return to the beliefs of Protestantism in the 15th century, then we will expose this deception and save the world a incalculable grief. I want to back up just a little bit from where we ended last time for continuity purposes. We're reading the portion of this little book entitled The Original, uh, The Origin of Dispensational Futurism and its Entry into Protestant Christianity. The chapter of it is entitled How Did Dispensational Futurism Enter Protestant Christianity? Now remember, Protestantism was based on the idea that Christ, Jesus Christ, fulfilled all 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy, including verse 27. And I will read that verse. It says, verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. This is speaking of Christ. It was he who confirmed the covenant in his blood. He fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies arriving in due time, in due season, on the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, three and a half years after he was baptized or anointed in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, He caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life. And that that covenant was confirmed in heaven, God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom, thus putting a permanent end to animal sacrifices. The 70th week of Daniel is over. It was fulfilled perfectly and completely by Jesus Christ the Messiah 2,000 years ago. But Unbelievers, and particularly the Vatican, does not like that outcome. And we know from history that the Jews also reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah. So the Vatican is going to work on a common goal secretly, and we're uncovering it now as we read this book. It says, how did dispensational futurism enter Protestant Christianity? The reformers to a man fiercely contested the futuristic thesis propounded by the Jesuit priest by the name of Ribera. Remember, Ribera is the one who said that verse 27 did not talk about Jesus the Messiah, but was talking about the Antichrist. It was he who would confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And in order to fulfill Rome's version of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, there must be a nation-state of Israel. So you know Rome is behind the creation of the nation-state of Israel. There must be Jews living in the land. So you know Rome must be responsible for the Jews having been forced down to Israel. We know there must be a covenant, a seven-year peace treaty, they say, 
with the Jews allowing them to begin animal sacrifices again, and then halfway through that treaty period, he will cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And that's when the whole world will be irrevocably convinced that this man is the Antichrist. But what did the Protestant reformers all believe? The Protestant reformers, two of the man, every single one, not one exception of the Protestant reformers, believe contrary to this, and that is that the Pope, the papacy, is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. Look no further than the papacy for Antichrist, either in the distant past or in the present or in the future. He is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, even to the day Christ returns and destroys him with the brightness of his coming. Now, the Reformers, to a man, fiercely contested the futuristic thesis propounded by Ribera, whose commentary on the book of Revelation is in the Cambridge Library, and all futurist commentaries since then are based on it. However, it was left to another Jesuit, Emmanuel Lacunza, who lived from 1731 to 1801, to complete the deception, and through him, dispensational futurism entered Protestant Christianity. Now, why is this a concern for us? Because if we believe in dispensational futurism, that there's a future fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, then we must reject everything the Protestant reformers taught. So you can simply equate the futurist lie to an attempt to destroy Protestantism. Remember, when you think of Protestantism, true Protestantism, it is a rebellion against Antichrist, the papacy. The whole Protestant Reformation was, was based on the, on the belief and the fact that the papacy is the Antichrist, and the Roman Catholic Church is that woman riding the scarlet-colored beast of Revelation chapter 17. So if you believe that the Antichrist is future, coming during a seven-year period of time they call the Great Tribulation, then you must reject the Protestant Reformation. And most, the lion's share of those who profess Protestantism today don't have a clue what Protestantism is really all about and cannot rightfully call themselves Protestant at all. Now, to complete the deception, and through him dispensational futurism entered Protestant Christianity. At the time of the overthrow of Judaism in A.D. 70, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was carried from Jerusalem in a casket. Now, you must have to ask yourself why this was done. This so-called Jewish rabbi out of Jerusalem in a casket to Vespasian, who was the, the Caesar of Rome. And Vespasian granted him, Ben Zakkai, permission to make his abode at Jamnii near the sea. Under his brilliant leadership, Judaism was revived and restored. Now, before I even go any further, and, and I may have covered this last time, <clears throat> but have you ever heard people calling us Christians in this country Judeo Christians? Judeo Christians, you believe you're a Judeo Christian? Well, what is Judaism? Well, it's a Babylonian perversion of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the true faith of Jesus Christ. The true faith of Christianity is that same faith held by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Judaism, which Jesus found in existence when he was baptized in the river, the religious the religion of the Jews at that time was Judaism. And it was, it was the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it was polluted with the false religion of Babylon, which the Jews simply brought back to the land after the Babylonian captivity. And this is why Jesus had so much fault with the religious leaders of his day. They had been Babylonianized, if you will. They were 
part Christian and part Babylonians, if you will. Now, so it is not proper to call yourself a Judeo-Christian if you hold the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, it might be correct if you are a Roman Catholic to call yourself a Judeo-Christian because through research, and you can duplicate this research for yourself, a careful study of Roman Catholicism reveals that it has its roots also in Babylon. As a matter of fact, the official Roman Catholic encyclopedia confirms that much of the ritual and the pomp and the circumstance and even the vestments of the priests are derived from what was practiced in Babylon. They simply baptized it in the name of Jesus and carried it on as though it were Christianity, and it's not at all. <clears throat> so Roman Catholicism has its roots in Babylon, and so does Judaism. So they've got something very much in common. And you're going to see a strategy in all of this to, to Babylonize the whole world. And this is what the Bible calls Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, Jamnii became the headquarters of world Jewry and remained such for four centuries when it was transferred to Babylonia, where a heavy Jewish population had remained since the Babylonian captivity. So here you see again the return to Babylon. And it says, Yochanan, Yochanan ben Zakkai revived the Babylonian Talmud, and his was known as the Palestine Talmud, and its compositors were Yochanan, Akiba, Meir, Judah the Great, being Rabbi Judah, whose title was Has Hasni the Prince. Hosni the Prince, and you can do your own research on this, and I'll spell it for you if you care to. It's H-A space N-A-S-I hyphen T-H-E space Prince. Hosni, Hana, excuse me, I'm pronouncing it wrong. Hanasi the Prince. Okay. Babylonia remained the center of world Jewry for the next several centuries. But as they became a state within a state, the Persian kings finally arose against her. Some leaders were hanged, Talmudic schools were closed, and the surviving Talmudists fled, finding refuge in the city of Cordoba in Spain. So now you see the center of world Jewry in Roman Catholic Spain. Both have Babylonian roots. And you're going to see what the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church have done this, and I think it will shock you. Just remember, the Roman Catholic Church denies that Jesus was the Christ. The Roman Catholic Church denies that it was Jesus who fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel because they teach a futurist fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. It's going to be someone other than Christ who is going to confirm a covenant. As a matter of fact, it's going to be some antichrist figure that they are going to conjure up. And all of this has the effect of putting up an opportunity to present the world with another Christ. Okay, Remember also that the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And many will argue that I am incorrect that the Roman Catholic Church preaches Jesus as the Messiah, but only for those who are duped. The, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church rejects Jesus as the Messiah and claims that the Pope is Jesus Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. They call the Pope and have always called the Pope the Vicar of Christ, and Vicar means replacement of Christ. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that by divine right, the papacy is the divine right ruler of the world. 
And so now you see a commonality between the Jews who reject Christ and the Roman Catholics who reject Christ, and now they're both centered in Europe. These, the, these uh, Babylonized Jews were finally got too big and too powerful for their Babylonian uh, uh, capital, and the Persian kings, remember the Babylonian Empire fell to the Persians, and the Persians saw them as obviously as a threat, and so they booted them out, and where they landed was Cordoba, Spain. And remember also that Spain was the foundation of the Jesuit order. Ignatius Loyola was a Basque Spaniard. Now, all this is going to make sense as we continue. He says, Cordoba became the world capital of Babylonized Judaism for, for several centuries. And here, Jewry enjoyed her golden age. Jewish influence was felt in both church and state in Spain. Thousands of Jews called Maranas joined the Roman Catholic Church while secretly adhering to Judaism. Now, people will ask the question, well, if they're Jews and they're practicing Judaism, why would they join the Roman Catholic Church? Simply because of religious persecution. Remember, the Roman Catholic Church teaches replacement theology that the Jews rejected Christ and, in a sense, sold their birthright when they did so. And, and they're, they're, they are destined to die as heretics, according to Roman Catholic canon law. And so Rome has always taught that she now replaces the Jews, that the Roman Catholic Church is now the chosen people of God. And so to make that stick, they have always persecuted the Jews and tried to annihilate them. And we even see during the Second World War an attempt to annihilate the Jews, six million. And those who have done any research into the subject of the, of the Holocaust realize that the Vatican was squarely behind the destruction of six million Jews and untold millions in Russia. So... So this is replacement theology being put in practice as evidence in history. Now, it says it was against this background that Rabbi Ben Ezra later wrote his book, which altered the whole course of Christian history. Posing as a converted Jew under the name Rabbi Ben Ezra, he was the author of the book called The Coming Messiah in Glory and Majesty. Now remember, this is a, an apparent Jew who obviously, as all Jews do, or most Jews do, reject Jesus as their Messiah. So they're still looking for their Messiah. And isn't it funny, the Roman Catholic Church is preparing to give them another Messiah, but it's not going to be Jesus. It's going to be the Pope. I might be getting ahead of some of my listeners, but we'll continue. Now, this, this Jesuit, or, or rather this Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Ben Ezra, writes a book entitled The Coming Messiah in Glory and Majesty, found effect upon the prophetic teaching during the early years of the 19th century. Strange, of course, to relate, he was neither a rabbi nor a converted Jew. For the startling truth is that, Yo that Juan Josephat Ben Ezra was the pseudonym behind which hid the Spanish Jesuit Emmanuel Lacunza. A Spanish Jesuit pretending to be a Jewish rabbi, a, a, a Babylonized Jew. And he writes a book called The Coming Messiah in Glory and Majesty, but it's a Jesuit. Now it says, in his book, Lacunza advanced the holy future day of the Lord interpretation of the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. This was similar to the Ribera Futurist scheme in which he had tried to spike the mighty guns of the Reformation and was virtually based upon his writings. So this, this, this Jesuit has the same teacher as I had for 50 years. 
this Jesuit priest by the name of Francisco Ribera teaching the futurist interpretation of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, the 70th week of Daniel, which the Protestant reformers saw was completely and perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. So do you see what's happening? They're going to put forward a phony antichrist in a man-made refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. They're going to create a modern nation state of Israel, make Jews forcibly move to the land, negotiate a treaty of seven years, allowing the Jews to begin animal sacrifices in a rebuilt temple, and then three and a half years cancel that agreement, and then the whole world will believe that this man is the Antichrist. And so what do you think Rome's attempt, uh, attempt to do will be right after that? Well, put up their own Christ. And they're going to try to deceive the Jews into believing that he is their Messiah. And I simply assert to you that it's going to be the papacy. So the futurist interpretation of Daniel 9.27 by Francisco Ribera, was designed to destroy the Protestant Reformation. You see, if you believe in a future Antichrist, you, can, you cannot accept that the papacy has always been the Antichrist in the world. So you simply, by default, if you believe in futurism, you have repudiated the Protestant Reformation. All right, now they're getting the Jews involved in this. Now, somebody might ask me the question, well, Tom, what evidence do you have that the Jews are going to accept this false Christ? Jesus said himself, when he was persecuted by the Jews, he said, I came in my Father's name, and you received me not. But there is one who is coming after me, who will come in his own name, and him you will receive. Jesus Christ, our Messiah, said to the Jews to their face, they were going to reject him and receive another. That they were going to reject the one who came in his father's name, but they were going to receive one who came in his own name. And I can tell you what that name is. The vicar of Christ. He comes in his own name a name that he gave himself, not a name that the Father gave him. He is Antichrist. That's the name that the Father gave him. But he gives himself a name, the Vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth. And it literally means the dictionary meaning of Vicar of Christ, or more correctly, <clears throat> Antichrist. That's what vicar of Christ means, antichrist. You can use the term vicar of Christ and antichrist synonymously. You can, you can use them interchangeably. They mean exactly the same thing. It's like I've said to many of my listeners, you could walk up to the Pope of Rome and say, hello, Mr. Antichrist, and he would probably stick out his hand to shake it and congratulate you for figuring out the riddle. But it's not much of a riddle. All you have to do is go to a dictionary. You'll find the word vicar and the prefix anti have the same meaning. Vicar is the replacement of. Anti is the replacement of. So antichrist simply means replacement of Christ. And replacement of Christ means antichrist. And antichrist means vicar of Christ and vice versa. Again, I will ask the listeners a question. If God went to so much trouble to describe precisely when Jesus was going to arrive, when the Messiah was going to arrive, by giving them Daniel's 70-week prophecy, <clears throat> when he went to so much trouble to see to it, that there was no excuse for missing the coming of Christ. 
why would God leave his people in doubt about who his counterfeit is? Why would God deal so treacherously with his people as to leave us in doubt about who the Antichrist is? Who would deceive the whole world? You know, many Christians today, if you ask them, who is the Antichrist? You know what they'll tell you? We're not supposed to know. How does that face logic? Why would God deal so wickedly with his own people? It's simply untenable. God wants his people to know who the Antichrist is. God wants his people not to be deceived by this man of sin, this son of perdition. And he made it plain. The fulfillment of Daniel 9, verse 27, was the Messiah. That whole prophecy was about the Messiah, except one very brief parenthetical reference to Titus, Prince Titus, who destroyed the city and the sanctuary in 70 A.D. The rest of that prophecy is all about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. From verse 24 all the way to the end of verse 27. We know who the Christ is. So why would God leave us in doubt about who the Antichrist is? And the answer is simple. The one who tries to refulfill the 70th week of Daniel as though Jesus were not the Christ and tried to deceive the whole world into believing in another Christ. That's what vicar means, another Christ, a substitute Christ, a counterfeit Christ, an antichrist. So whoever you see in the world trying to re-fulfill the 70th week of Daniel is denying that Jesus was the Messiah and asserting that he himself is the Messiah. Jesus came in his own name, and the Jews rejected him, but Jesus said plainly, that there would come one after him who would come in his own name, a name that the Father did not give him, and him they would receive. And we are seeing through futurism, dispensational futurism, and the creation of the modern nation state of Israel, and the the forcible uh, exodus of Jews moving down into the land, and the proposed new temple and beginning animal sacrifices again has to be a, a, a virtual, a man-made attempt to refulfill the 70th week of Daniel, not according to the truth, according to the lie, the greatest lie that has been told since the Garden of Eden. Now, Jesuit Francisco Rivera gave us this bogus Jesuit futurist scheme to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And that it has pretty well done. There are almost no Protestants today who can tell you who the Antichrist is. They'll say, we're not supposed to know, or we don't need to worry about it because he's not going to show up until the last seven years before Christ's return. And besides, we're all going to be raptured out of here anyway. So it says, continuing now, he says, it was also to Lacunza, alias Ben Ezra, that the two stages theory of the Second Advent owes its origin, and some competent historians are of the opinion that its twin theory, the secret rapture, may yet be traced to him. So here we have a Jesuit fomenting the futurist belief, thus destroying the Protestant Reformation, and then frosting it with this so-called secret rapture. And I call the rapture, which I believed in for 50 years, please don't condemn me, I'm not condemning you, to condemn you for believing the futurist interpretation of Daniel 9.27 and to believe in the rapture would simply be to condemn myself. I believed the lie just as did everyone else. For 50 years of my life I believed this. But what I believe the secret rapture doctrine is today is simply the frosting on the futurist cake. You know, cake is pretty good without frosting, but you can live without it. But if you put frosting on it, you can't spit it out. 
And the secret rapture doctrine is just exactly that, the frosting on the futurist cake. Both are Jesuit creations. Both are, de- are intended to destroy Protestantism. Because Protestantism <clears throat> believes that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. Now, the secret rapture may yet be traced to this Jesuit priest, and it says the London publication in 1816 of a complete Spanish edition of this work was the prelude to the advent of dispensational futurism. So they've got it all together now. They're ready to promote dispensationalism and dispensational futurism. And it says, not long after, Dr. S.R. Maitland, librarian to the Archbishop of Canterbury, issued a series of pamphlets assailing the historic Protestant interpretation of prophecy and quite evidently based upon Ben Ezra's book, The Coming Messiah in Glory and Majesty. So if you're going to promote a future Antichrist in this future dispensational this future uh, dispensational futurism, in order to succeed, you must destroy the historic belief of the Protestant reformers. The Protestant reformers to the man were historicists. They were neither preterists nor futurists, but historicists. And they believed that the book of Revelation was not fulfilled in the long-distant past, as believed by the preterists, nor did they believe that the book of Revelation would be fulfilled in the distant future, as believes, as is believed by the futurists today, but that the book of Revelation was simply a chronological recollection Christian era from beginning to end. That's the true interpretation of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, if viewed in any other light than an an historical light, cannot be understood correctly. Again, if you believe all the prophecies in the book of Revelation were fulfilled in the long-distant past, you're a preterist. If you believe those prophecies won't be fulfilled until the last seven years of time before Christ's return, you're a futurist. But if you believe that the book of Revelation was written by John the Revelator to describe Christianity from its beginning to its end, you are an historicist. You are correct. And as an historicist, you also believe that Antichrist has been a factor among God's people trying to destroy the kingdom of Christ throughout its entire history. That's the correct interpretation of the book of Revelation. Just the way John the Revelator wrote it. We've been seeing Protest- uh, we've been seeing the revelations fulfilled all throughout the Christian era. The truth is, futurism is a Jesuit lie. So is preterism. Doricism is the truth. And you must understand that there were neither preterists nor futurists prior to about three generations ago. Every Christian prior to that time was was an historicist. They believed the book of Revelation was a foretelling of the entire Christian era from the time of Christ till his return. And what is the major component of that history? The Antichrist. Now, if you believe that the major component of that historical account given to us in the, Re- in the book of Revelation, then you cannot be a preterist and you cannot be a futurist. You must be an historicist. Preterism and futurism are the new kids on the block. They're still wet behind the ears, and they are dead wrong. Protestant reformers were absolutely correct in their interpretation of Bible prophecy. They believe that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, 
There's no future fulfillment of it. Jesus was the Christ, and the papacy is the Antichrist. If you believe otherwise, you cannot call yourself a Protestant. Now, other members of the Anglo-Catholic party, such as de Berg, Newman, and others, were naturally attracted to this futurist monstrosity of the Jesuits, and also the secret rapture icing that glazed it. And in 1827, Edward Irving, a Scottish Presbyterian minister who was based in London, translated the whole work into English. It is a striking thing that a short time after this, the eloquent Irving was stirring the metropolis as with flaming oratory, he preached the secret rapture. All right, so this creation by the Jesuits called the secret rapture was picked up by a Presbyterian minister by the name of Edward Irving, and he was making a lot of hay with it. He was getting a lot of attention with it. And it says, later in London, in the congregation of Edward Irving, there broke out a series of emotional exhibitions, which included the communication of ecstatic utterances. Let me just tell you what they were. They were tongues. Okay? They were believing in the rapture. They were believing in the futurist lie. And all of a sudden, they were speaking in tongues that was confirming all of these Jesuit lies. Now, one of these utterances was to have widespread results. For soon after 1830, a woman, while speaking in tongues, announced, quote, the revelation, unquote, that the true church would be caught up or raptured to heaven before the tribulation and before Christ returned to earth. Now, Again, you can tell by this that it was first given by a woman speaking in tongues, but also that they were already in the belief that there was going to be a future tribulation. And you've heard about the seven years of great tribulation, that the tribulation will take place in a period of seven years just prior to Christ's return. But if you are aware of history, if you are aware of church history, if you are aware of Roman Catholic history, if you are an historicist, then you have to understand that the persecution of God's people have has been ongoing for the last 2,000 years. First, the pagan Romans put the Christians in the, in the Colosseum and fed them to lions, making mockery of Daniel in the lion's den, making mockery of the the true prophet of God who foretold the very time when Jesus would be baptized in the River Jordan and would be the Messiah of the Jews. And then you see immediately after the, the, the Roman Empire fell and the Holy Roman Empire immediately took its place, you know, the, the one, the, he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way, and then that man of sin shall be revealed, that wicked one, Paul was talking about. When the pagan Roman Empire died, when Caesar left Rome and made his abode in Byzantium, or Constantinople as it was eventually called, uh, then who stood up in his place? the papacy, and that began the Holy Roman Empire, which is not holy at all. It is Antichrist. Now, it was the persecution of the saints continued under the Holy Roman Inquisition in the form, or under the Holy Roman Empire in in the form of the Inquisitions and the Crusades. The Dark Ages, the Medieval Ages, when the Pope, the man of sin, ruled over the kings of the earth and commanded the kings of the earth on pain of excommunication and eternal damnation to extirpate and annihilate the heretics out of their realms. And that's the persecution of the saints. History reveals when the persecution took place, 
when the great tribulation took place, the Christian era, by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the historic Antichrist, the one believed by the Protestants, historicists. They had it right. But this woman, speaking in tongues, following the Jesuit leading, was, was teaching that Christians would be caught up or raptured out of the Great Tribulation. But the Bible says, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's a, very, it's a contradiction of very Scripture, this secret rapture idea. The woman, while speaking in tongues, announced the revelation that the true church would be caught up or raptured to heaven before the tribulation and before Christ's return to earth. Edward Irving was deposed from the ministry and died in 1834, but not before his pre-tribulationism had been introduced at the power court meetings. Now, the power court meetings were like the great uh, uh, prophecy uh, conventions that are held in this country today. Only the power court were, had the sanction of, of the hierarchy in England. The power court was a castle named Power Court, and the meetings were held there. And they began to teach this Jesuit futurism, rapture, they eventually called pre-tribulationism, and it's still being taught in the churches today. It runs completely counter to what was taught by the Protestant reformers. Okay? All this futurism that is taught in the churches today could not have been taught unless they had repudiated the historicist teaching of the Protestant reformers. And after the, the, the historicist belief of the Protestant reformers were adequately assailed, the Jesuits were prepared to, to launch their futurism and their rapturism, and now the whole world is deceived, waiting for a future Antichrist and another Christ. Now, Oh, it looks like I've run out of time, so I'll make a mark in this little book. I hope my listeners are beginning to comprehend what is happening here, and we'll continue next Wednesday on the program. You've been listening to uh, Mystery Babylon News Radio by Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Fress, host of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'll tune in Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. at www.firstamendmentradio.com, Listen to my program, and I'm sure that you'll be like most. You'll have your eyes open to the truth, the historical truth, and you'll reject futurism and reject the rapturism, reject Jesuitism, and reject Antichrist, the Pope of Rome, and find your home in the kingdom of Christ. Thanks again for listening. I'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>